This has come to Daddy with Ruben K, the podcast for people who never fully weaned or latched, but have a very complex relationship with suction. I'm not saying I've got issues with my parents, but last night I said to my Uber delivery driver, thank you, Daddy. I'm here at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, where the greatest minds of our generation gather together to battle it out in a 60-40 split Hunger Games death match. Anyone who is anyone in comedy is here, which is why my producer, Amanda, definitely isn't. How are you doing, Amanda? As I am the one that edits these podcasts, I could cut out all of the insults that Ruben throws at me, but I've decided I want them out there in the public domain as evidence that I can use in the tribunal. But before those acrimonious divorce proceedings, we've got more podcasts for you. As always, please like, download, listen, share. Also, if you like what you hear, you can go and see what's going on on our YouTube channel. There's some pictures up there that go with the words. And you can view Ruben at work in all his Technicolor Cinemascope glory. A quick note about this here pod. Ruben and the guest met up to do this chat and recorded everything on Ruben's mobile. So it sounds like two guys having a chat in a toilet cubicle, which, knowing them, it possibly was. But it's great. So enjoy. I'm going. Shut up. Goodbye. So let's get into it. My guest today is a comedian whose parents are both pretty cool, but still happily married, which makes me wonder where in God's name he gets all the award-winning material. And trust me, it is award-winning and I fucking hate it. He credits his mum with helping launch his comedy career and she definitely made a good call as he now has 10 plus international tours, a book and shitloads of telly, including two Netflix specials under his belt. I loathe him. Come to Daddy, Daniel Sloss. Hello, friend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what are you? You live in Edinburgh? I do. You're an actual comedian who lives in Edinburgh yes. and so just comes here mm. for the month of Edinburgh. Yeah, no, so I get to see it for the other 11 months where it's still beautiful and there's, you know, less of you cuts in it. <laughs> it must be so nice. Don't get me wrong, I love, I love it because it's like all of my very talented friends from all over the world coming to where I live. To my to where I live for a month to develop alcohol problems and drug problems. Yeah. And they're like, do you want to do lunch? Do you want to hang out? And it's man, it's still like exhausting, but like it's a good exhausting. I get to see so many. How many shows did you do this Edinburgh? <laughs> oh, two. I did two shows. And my favourite thing has been to go around with my wife because she genuinely said it out loud the other day. She was like, I just wish the fringe could just be like a week longer. And I'm like, quick, come say that in front of performers. <laughs> I want to I wanna see them spit on you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I was about to say, if any of these comedians knew how to cock a shotgun, oh, you'd God. hear it. But they'd all just break a nail. Yeah, I did two shows. I've seen fucking 21. I'm having the time of my life. The thing is, like, I always think it's so important in, in, in comedy, especially, like, to make sure you become friends with the people you find funniest because that's the only way you're going to get funnier is with... And that's why Daniel stalked me. Yeah, I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I found you in the lobby of the Just for Laughs Hotel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he latched onto me like a remora onto I swear a to shark. God, it was the only reason I downloaded Grinder. My wife doesn't believe me, but I was just <laughs> to find out where you were in the building. Tell me another way and then I'll do it. But it's just the easiest way. It's because Daniel assumed rightly that my grinder profile would have my floor and room number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also whenever you were getting closer to me, it just played the Jaws theme tune. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, this is my little parental questionnaire and it's quick fire answers. Okay. Names of parents. Leslie and Martin. Fantastic. If they transition, you don't need to change them. Yeah. Do they live in Edinburgh? They live in Fife. What is Fife? Fife is, it's called the Kingdom of Fife, though if you ask any of us, we can Moving can't on, how much do you blame them for how you turned out as a percentage? Ooh, 75. 75? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where's the other 25? Uh, my sister died when I was eight. She was six, so oh, like... we're getting deep, quick. Like, yeah, well, here's the thing, like, because at the time, like, because it was just a normal thing that happened in my life, like, it wasn't until I became older and I started talking about it on stage that 
uh, she started being like, oh man, maybe that did fuck me up more than I thought it did. Mm. I remember watching the Lewis Capaldi documentary and he was talking about the song that's about his aunt who killed herself. And he was like, when she, she killed herself when he was so young that from then on he thought about death every day because death was common. And when he was an adult, he realised that other people didn't think about death every day. And that's somebody who thinks about death every mm. single fucking day. I'm like, other people aren't doing that? So like young, early trauma, very grateful for the trauma. Like, I mean, she called me, my dead sister called me a wonderful show. <laughs> I, my dead that, sister got me a wonderful show and other poems yeah, for small children. And I profited off of an emotionally abusive ex. Like you just gotta turn that trauma into cash. This is true. Cause I'm also a bit of a, a death head. I think about it a lot. Um, is that the joy you get from thinking about it, the way that, because you think about it often, you think about it in a 360 way. It's mm -hmm. not just about the fear. And for people who don't necessarily do that, they just think of death as this like black monolith, mm. this inescapable thing, whereas we kind of chew it around in our mouths a bit. So you see like, oh, the funny side of it. You see the absurd side of it. You see, so sometimes you get like comfort from it or joy from it. Yeah, my, well, I always think the most powerful thing in the world, the most powerful act of rebellion is to laugh at the thing that is oppressing mm. you. Like, mm. and whether that's so, so someone in a position of power or whatever, being able to laugh in the face of fucking death, the one thing that we all have in common, yeah. is a really powerful thing. And I understand for a lot of people, a lot of people's, the way they process grief is to just be sad and to just cry and to get it out and to like go to therapy and go to meetings and do all this stuff. And that's a if that works for you, that's great for you. But there is 20% of the world who the way they deal with grief is making horrible jokes about yeah. it because that's the thing that softens it for us. Like we're able to- Look at the heart of old Jewish comedy. Look at Jackie Mason, look at Joan Rivers, look at all the people who you hold up as comedy icons are often George Carlin, yeah. are the ones who just- like, it's why Jews are the funniest, because it's shitty true. things just keep happening. <laughs> happening. We're the chosen people, but chosen for what? Yeah, chosen for comedy. <laughs> chosen. <laughs> like, I, I mean, being Jewish, you just be like, looking at your God, being like, man, I know you know we can handle this, but I just think there was a funny, an easier way to get us to tell dick jokes. <laughs> like, I think, like, did it have to be that many of us? That seemed excessive. Like, and I just think there's certain pettiness as well in it. I mean, yes, of course, there's huge trauma. There's a whole series, but then there's just shit like, oh, walk in a circle in the desert for 40 years. Mm. Just something tiny like that. God's a, God's a bitch, man. He's a very, very, very just toxic go, man. He's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your therapist would tell you to break up with him if he was a boyfriend. Absolutely. Fuck it. Red flag galore. Yeah. Hey, I want you to kill your son to prove you love me. JK just wanted to see if you'd do it. Do Motherfuck, you... are you kidding me? <laughs> hey, tell me about Leslie and Martin. You seem so hashtag well adjusted. That's mm, irony. That a, was irony. A little bit. I my parents are wonderful. I'm, I'm very close to both my parents. My wife finds my relationship with my parents because she doesn't say I love you to her parents because her family just know that they love each other and that's not with you. But why? But how do they know if they don't say it? Right. Right? I don't know if that is it just assumed? Yeah, it's just assumed like I, I, I that, that's straight culture. But she that's weird. she phones her mum more than I phone my mum. But I, I have told my mother in law and my father in law that I love them more than they've ever heard it from their daughter. I gotta say, you're so off stage, so wholesome, so <laughs> lovely, so kind, so gentle, so soft, so daffy. Yeah. On stage. Bag of shit. You look like what happens if you deny school shooters access to guns? Yeah, yeah, man. The only reason, the only reason I would never live in America is because if I had access to guns, I would kill so many people. Yeah, you're like, an angry boy with a list. Oh, and my mum is. My, my, I remember being like 13 or 14 years old, and I've always ranted. The world's always been unfair, and there's been injustice in it. And I've always thought the answer to it was to just fucking scream and rage about it. Yeah. And obviously, the only way to get people to listen to your rants is to make them funny. Otherwise, they're just bored of you ranting. Mm. And my mum would just listen to me have these fucking tirades in the car, and she's just like. Where is all this anger coming from? Like, all we ever did was love you. We, you know, we, we look after you. We're very under, they're very liberal parents. They're very cool. Like, it's a very little Lord Fauntleroy thing to have everything and still be furious at yeah. injustice. Yeah, 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 I am. I'm, I'm such an angry person. And the big difference between me and my wife, and I just didn't know people like this could exist. She's just, you've met her. She's the happiest person. Her base oh, yeah. setting is just happy. I'm in therapy. And I'm talking to my therapist and, and we get to like this fucking breakthrough point 
where I'm, I suddenly realized that I have anxiety and I've been covering up my anxiety with ego. And that's why all through my 20s, I was this massive fucking ego. And that was so I never had a moment of the, you know, the, the, the crippling self-doubt. And it wasn't me realizing that it was all this fucking cover up. And, and then I started going over my thoughts in my head. And I'm like, oh my God, I do have a really bad internal monologue. And I'm just t- I tell my wife everything. And I'm like, yeah, so I've just got all these doubts all the time and these fears and all this worry in my head. And she listens like a loving partner she is. And after 15 minutes, I'm like, do you ever get like any thoughts of this, like this in your head? And she went, no, I guess I just have a quiet brain. Like so when we sit there, we over, they think, she's just sitting there with fucking the SpongeBob theme tune playing over and over in her head. There's just like two cats bouncing a ball backwards <laughs> between each other. There's just little fucking cartoons and things going on. Do you think Leslie and Martin are going to listen to this? My mum absolutely will, 100%. Now I read on the Wikipedia that it's basically thanks to your mum that you're in comedy. Yeah, kind of. Like I did... St- Stage acting for years, which she signed me up to because Hang she just watched me out of the fucking house. Yeah, my mum worked from home and I was an annoying child, so she would send me up to any course in any camp within a 20 mile vicinity to just get me the fuck out of the house after school. She knew I loved, I watched stand up from the age of five and I loved being on stage, but I hated doing normal acting. And then my mum signed me up to have the fucking comedy course. She also met Frankie Boyle at like a corporate gig for her company and she was like, My son is really interested in comedy. And he was very gracious. He gave her his email address. And then you started, what, writing with for... No, 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 I, no. he gave me like fucking like, uh, when he was writing for Model of the Week, he was sort of giving me this stuff in advance to just sort of teach me how to write to a gotcha. deadline and stuff and being like, okay, this is, you know, work ethic sort of thing. And he did use some of the jokes, but there was, there was no point before Mock the Week where Frankie was like, I can't go on stage. The 17 year old boy hasn't sent me through his shitty jokes. <laughs> like he was, he was very much out of the kindness of his own heart as opposed to necessity. That's lovely. And yeah. then I, there's a story about your mum. You took a gap year off. You yeah. were studying, you were going to study history. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With an end to do what? No idea. I just, I just liked history. Well, because it's gossip. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. History yeah, yeah. is just gossip that's been written in Helvetica. Yeah, 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 yeah. Go, uh, yeah, about uh, yes, <laughs> about, about gay Greeks and Romans. Just no, uh, they were they were just roommates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're just friends. For one, there was I saw the funniest. King James was just a lonely man with a lot of male friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lots of visitors, and for some reason, he was buried beside a lot of his male friends yeah. because they were just such good good chums. <laughs> <laughs> So you were going to study history yeah. and you took a gap year. Yeah, to pursue uh, my mum's suggestion. She went, no, lots of people take a gap year at the end of university. Why don't you take a gap year before? Because things were going well in my career. I just got to the final of So You Think You're Funny. I just signed with my agent who I'm still with. You signed with an agent at what, 18, 19? Uh, 18. 18. 18, yeah. Uh, and then she was like, just, you don't do that. And then I did a gap year. And by the end of that gap year, I did my first fucking fringe. I was I had a fucking pilot picked up for BBC. And, it don't matter. and fucking, I've always found this funny. I emailed just an email address at Dundee University, the only one that accepted me for history. And I go, hey, I said I was going to defer it for a year, but just to let you know, comedy's going well, so I'm actually not going to come to university at all. Thank you for accepting me. They were like, hey, you've actually sent this to the wrong place. Can you fill out this form explaining your reasons and send it back to us? I'm like, no. <laughs> you you tell the person who's next up. My part's done. Yeah. I'm not coming and there's nothing you can do to make me come and attend. Like, you've got the information. Ball's in your court. See you later, motherfuckers. Yeah. This is fair. But in that gap year, this is about the, the detail that I find interesting about this, is mum just made you sit down at the dinner table while she was working well, and was, write jokes. While she was at home working in her office, my mum worked from home, so while she was working, being outsourced by the fucking UN for global warming stuff. We'll get to that later. Um, she's writing all this. I would be sitting on the other side and she wanted me to just, she was like, you, if this is going to be your job, you have to treat it like a job. You have to have um, a work ethic. And that's, you know, that definitely helped my career. Like, you know, I did... The first three or four fringe shows I did were dog shit, but nobody fucking remembers them. And after those first four, I suddenly was able to t- turn out a really good hour every year. Are Leslie and Martin funny? It's so fucking funny. Uh, very, very funny people. But the problem is my mum uh, is, uh, is a very happy person and doesn't need her love and affection from strangers. Uh, but she, when she does, she does speeches and, and, and talks for work and she's very funny in those. 
And my father, who is an introvert, if he wasn't an introvert, would be a very, very good stand-up comedian. My dad it will go to all of my friends' shows when they're doing previews, and they will come to my dad for tax because he's got a really good comedy mind. He couldn't, and you know, I don't think he'd be able to like write like a full routine. Um, but, but sometimes an editor, an editing oh, mind, that's and, he, a big and one. He's, he's got a comedy mind. They're both. My parents still to this day will come to my shows and be like, "I think that like could be tight." Okay, how do you take notes from your parents? Because I have creative parents. The, yeah, the listeners of the pod will know, um, and they have notes yeah. all the time, and it, they try and give it to me, and it just burns me. It does something to my emotional thing where I have a reaction, and I now have to say to them, "I can't take." Critique, I just need support. My mum's very good at, you know, she's always said, if you want Daniel to do something, ask him to do it once. And if you never want him to do it, ask him to do it twice. Like, oh, you ask me to do something once, I'll do it. If you ask me to do it a second time, just out of sheer fucking stubborn, I will not do that fucking thing. That's so, brilliant. So her thing was That's always, really she under, she's like, I will t- give him the fucking notes. I will tell him what I think. And it's his job to just take on board or not. My dad will occasionally be like, I think this line is funny. My dad will, it's, it's so fucking funny. My dad will go back to like jokes that I used to do that I eventually cut out shows because they were the weakest part of the show. And he's got this, he will remember the routine and he'll be like, can you bring this back now? Because you're a better comic now. So maybe you can get this joke working. I thought it was a really funny bit, but just because you, know, you were younger and more amateurish. And, it, and he remembers these jokes that I don't fucking remember. And he's able to like do them almost word for word. Like, you know, my parents are like... <laughs> and they were comedy, they were like comedy people before you. My mum and dad, became when, when they got married in London, they would go to a comedy club called Screaming Blue Murder, which was hosted by... Uh, I think it was Phil Jupiter's, and when Phil Jupiter's couldn't do it, it was Eddie Izzard. And it was to like wow. anywhere between 12 people or 100 people, depending. And they just watched all these comedians cut their fucking teeth. Like, so my parents love comedy. Just give us a run now, just quickly, what are Martin and Leslie's jobs? You mentioned the UN before. My mum has a PhD in microbiology and biochemistry, and she's the leading expert in Europe on mercury emissions and greenhouse gases. And so for the first uh, <laughs> half of her career, her job was looking at uh, mercury emissions in coal and how we can do safer burning. And in the past three years, because the West is now obsessed with lowering its carbon, Footprint, what they're doing is they're making India do everything. Uh, and obviously, if India doesn't stop using fossil fuels, the world is fucked. But it's very hard to tell a developing nation yeah. uh, that they have to stop this thing that brings in and holds up a lot of their economy. So she's helping them transition into a cleaner and better. Because and, all of India's coal burning stuff is very out of date and it's her job mm. to sort of make it better. Uh, my father is a computer programmer who works on underwater sonar where you stick something to the bottom of a boat and you go over a shipwreck and it will give you a 3D scan on the computer. He was responsible for like the technology and like uh, the, the first 3D live uh, X-ray where you could see the heart beating in real time and the lungs breathing. Viciously into intellectual people. Is anyone else listening to this and thinking, why are we the ones on this podcast? Oh, man, my mum and dad would be so brilliant on this podcast. My mum, they're both very funny. My dad would be shy at first, but my dad is not shy around comedians because he loves comedy so much. Yeah. They're like, he won't talk to like any of his fucking high school friends, but if I set him at a table, eventually he'll get the confidence to just talk about comedy to comedians. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a brilliant job. Yeah, my, my father. Really incredible. Was, do you know the TV show Robot Wars? Yes. Yeah, my dad was on that for four or five seasons as a contestant, and they made a made a robot that was so powerful that it was technically illegal. So we weren't. Hang on, to... Hannah. I think I is it the one that has the spinning blade that flips them up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't believe I've seen your dad's yeah, robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, me, who's like maybe watched all three seconds of yeah. gifts of robot gifts. How old I call them gifts? Yeah. Of um TikToks and shit, and I've seen that. There is, I, I'll, I'll be able to find it afterwards. My dad, my dad had the Robux, he's a fucking nerd. It was called Bot of Hell, it was a pun on Battle that, of Hell. That's very good. And it was shaped like a motorbike, and, and the front wheel was the spinning disc, and on the back was a little metal bike rider who was called Metal Oaf instead of me. Midloaf. And at the age of nine or ten, my parents on national fucking television, the BBC dressed me up in a little biker gear with a fucking bandana. Uh, and because we had no weapon, we got knocked out in the first round and I cried on national television because I was devastated. Uh, and they, But then after that, because my dad's so fucking smart, the house robot guys were just like, how did you get it to do this thing? And my dad like took the back of their controller off and went, that's wired wrong and you need to do this. And if you put it on this frequency, it'll be better. And ended up getting like a job working on the show for two fucking weeks, which is like nerd mecca. 
Yeah. Your family suffered like a, a pretty severe loss when your sister died. Mm -hmm. Can you just tell us a little bit about it? Uh, well, she, so she had cerebral palsy, which is like a condition which you get. It's not in the womb. You get it when you come out. Like I think she had the cord around her neck and stuff. So it mm -hmm. just basically um, stunts their growth. I don't. I, she, I think the dog just said to my parents that like she was not going to live until she was like beyond five. Um, but she made it to six or seven. She was a very happy girl, she, uh, fucking very disabled, like right. couldn't walk, couldn't talk, laughed at everything, uh, farted constantly, and they were fucking, they were, they were like room destroyers. <laughs> and then she'd find that very funny. <laughs> um, it's uh, not far from you no, as a personality type. No, no, no. Um, but man, we always laughed about like, you know, her, man, if you have a disabled sibling, it's very funny. <laughs> like, man, they're fucking. It's a weird fucking situation. Yeah. You get put into uncomfortable fucking scenarios, and you're comfortable with it because you know, fucking. It's she's your my, every day. She's my fucking sister. I don't give a shit. But other people get uncomfortable about it, and that's where you. Other people get get uncomfortable because of their own fear of yeah. disability, death. Vulnerability. Oh, I'd never want it to happen to me. And then they get worried about your feelings as sort of a masquerade for their own. We used to fear. love. We used to love parking in the disabled spot and making sure Josie got out of the car last. <laughs> because so you'd park this big fucking Toyota Previa as close as you fucking can. But and also, by the way, here's a little for those of you that don't have disabled sis siblings, right? They don't need better parking. They're in fucking wheelchairs, right? <laughs> They should be parking the farthest away from the fucking Asda, right? She's not getting fucking tired. There's no advantage to my sister getting out closer. It's the but, but only if only if the parking is downhill. Yeah, yeah. If they have to roll up, then it's then, an issue. Then it's fucking cruel. That's where elevators and fucking ramps go in. So my dad would get out of the car, not disabled. My mum would get out of the car, not disabled. And you can see other people in the car park angry. And even though they don't, they don't have a right to the disabled parking mate, they're angry that somebody else is cheating mm. the fucking system. And I get out of the car, I hammer up a little bit. I'm like, am I, am I not on all disability? <laughs> not all disabilities is visible. Is this like a limp or is this a brain thing? Yeah. And then Captain fucking Spaz gets out. <laughs> and she's garnegging and fucking laughing and screaming. And you can just see all the anger in this person's face disappear. Be like, oh no, she gets the, she gets the spot. She gets yeah, the yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. And she, she died when? She died when I was about, I think I was eight, seven or eight. Yeah. Um, I remember, I mean, the day is burned into my fucking uh, brain. Like, she would go to hospital all the time because she just kept trying to die. Yeah. That bitch got me in so many ambulances and that <laughs> made her an excellent sister. <laughs> um, and there was just one night where, you know, my I think my fucking mum and my dad woke me up at one in the morning and they're like, Josie's having a fit again. And I'm like, all right, fair enough. And sometimes they were bad enough that we had to take her into hospital. So I went over to my neighbours who were used to me staying there whenever Josie needed to be rushed in. And then, like, the next morning, I wake up and I put on my school uniform and I go downstairs and my neighbour is just sobbing. And I'm like, oh, that's a weird thing for someone to do. Maybe she had, like, a bad dream or something mm -hmm. like that. And I'm like, I'm going to go to school. And she's like, oh, you should go home first. And I'm like, no, I think I'll just go straight to school. Like, it's actually closer. And she was like, go home. And then I got back and, like, my dad was home from work. And I'm like, fuck it, yeah, I love when dad's home from work. That's class. And then my grandparents were there and everyone was sad. And I'm like, oh, this isn't good. And then my, I think, I can't remember what I, I can't remember, I think it was my, I think it was my mum said Josie's dead. And I remember, I think my grief at the age of eight was like five minutes of me like falling down, just screaming and crying. And that obviously setting everyone else off. And then becoming so instantly uncomfortable at the fact that like all of the funniest people in the world, like my mum, my dad, my grandparents are very funny. My uncle's very funny. My aunts are funny. There's all these funny people and none of them laughing. And I fucking hated it. Mm. I hated that they weren't laughing. So obviously I was like, well, that's the responsibility of an eight-year-old to try and make these. And so I was making jokes way too fucking early. Way, way, way too yeah. fucking early. <laughs> my, my uncle, I, my mum always tells the story. I wasn't allowed to go to the church pit of my sister's funeral. Because even at I was a young age, I've always been a very angry atheist. I have no respect for any religion. No. Um, I will keep my opinions to myself, but I don't, I, I don't tolerate mm. stupidity. 
And, and they were like, well, we're not going to take him to a church where he's just going to scream and talk about how bullshit it is. Like, religion is important to other people, and if he can't respect that, we're not going to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm allowed to go to the bit where they fucking stick her in the ground, and the horse pulls up beside the house, and my uncle's there with me, and he's just like, he's watching an eight year old process grief, seeing his sister come in this thing. Mm. And, he's like, and he's like, what do I say? You know, what do you, what do you, what do you say to this moment that's probably going to be in the head of this kid for the rest of his fucking life? How do you make this normal and fine? And the horse turned up and apparently I just whispered under my breath, huh, limo. <laughs> 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 and my uncle had to be like, it's not a limo, but I'm like, man, that is a fucking limo. As a limo. It's a limo with a bed. Yeah. So we followed the limo. We're not allowed in the limo. That was weird. I remember the being annoyed at that. And I remember, <laughs> you weren't allowed in the limo. And I remember getting up to the, the, the where they're sticking her in the ground and everyone's there and crying and it's sort of all sort of mm. like, okay, this is, you know, a moment. Um, and then my, then my, my teacher was there. My teacher was there outside of school. You ever seen a teacher outside of school? That's oh, very weird. It's so exciting. Yeah. They're not in school teacher clothes. They're just wearing black for some fucking reason. She's there. She's crying. I'm waving. She doesn't care. I'm like, ah, from, from primary. <laughs> and then, yeah. But then, you know, even after that, like, you know, my parents would make jokes all the time about it. That was a, they, but in fact, they had two very different processes to go. My dad, to this day, I think if you were to ask my da- dad the day Josie died, I don't think he'd be able to tell you. He's like, bottle it up, hide it away. It was the worst day of my life. I never want to fucking think about it. Whereas my mum, I think, processes emotions more in the way that I have learned to, and I think it's healthier. Whereas I would come downstairs and my mum would be watching videos of Josie when she was growing up or whatever, and my mum would be ironing, and she would just be sobbing. And she would watch these things all the time. And me and my dad were always like, why are you doing this to yourself? Like, what? And she's like, no, this is good. Mm. Like, I like being this sad because that's how much I love my daughter. I don't ever want to ever forget yeah. how much I love this person. And the fact that this still hurts as much. And, then, you know, and, and I was happy then. And I am happy that I called it. And, and for years and years, that was mind-blowing to me. I'm like, yeah, that's just you burning yourself with something and being like, but I'm used to the pain. Mm. And then now that I'm sort of older, I'm like, oh, there is some real beauty to loss Mm -hmm. to you know to miss someone and to to you know love someone so much that it can make you want to die when they're gone Mm. is something special and yeah i kind of get it a bit more now one of your therapists said i love that you have more than one that losing a sibling at such a young age made you yearn for love and stability in kids Mm -hmm. you've now achieved all of the above yes how old is your son now? He's 18 months. 18 months. Yeah. I've met him. He's beautiful. He is. He He's is. definitely Kara's son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's people's, the people who don't really look at me are like, oh my God, he looks just like you to me. And I'm like, he doesn't. He has blonde hair and blue eyes. And if yeah. that's the, like, from a police description, <laughs> like, absolutely. But he's got her nose. He's got her happiness. Like, he's just mm. wake up every day is a fucking new day, aren't we? He's just happy to be here. Which is good, because when you become a parent, you really self-reflect on the things in yourself that you do not want to see in your child. Yeah. Like, I'm like, I don't want him to have my fucking nose. I don't want him to have... Oh, I thought you were just going to say about, like, anxiety. But no, you're thinking purely physical. Well, man, look, if he, if he gets my cock, he'll have fun in his fucking 20s. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, that, that, that'll be fun for him and give him confidence. But yeah, no, I don't, look, I don't want him to have my anxiety. I don't want him to have my predilection to addiction. I don't want him to... Uh, be, I, I, man, if he were to become a comedian, I, th- I would think I failed. Yeah, right. Like I, you know, I was going to ask that if you would say, would you want him to follow into comedy? No, in because way? I'd be, I would either he's getting into comedy because something happened to him in his childhood that made him need it, like the, the, that's the way he processes fucking trauma, or worse, he wants to do comedy because he thinks it's the only way he can get my attention, and that means that mm-hmm. during his life, I've he made comedy enough. seem more important than him. And as much as I love comedy, and she has been my mistress for almost 17 years now, uh, she does not compare to the love I have for my son or my wife, and they will always be my priority. What lessons will you take from Martin and Leslie when you're raising your child? Um, or to just, you know, to, to, to be loving parents and to like, you know, when they fail. My parents, they would admonish me when they needed to, and they would guilt trip me when they needed to, but everything was up for discussion. I was always allowed to outwardly process my emotions and I was, you know, we got into arguments and stuff and it was all stuff I did. 
but my parents were very patient and they would have adult com they would treat me like an adult from a very young age which was good um and yeah i mean i i, I remember at the age of fucking 18 i think my mum found my weed stash and she brought it up to me and we spoke about it for a bit and I was like, look, I'm getting into the stage of my life where I can either be honest with you about everything or you can choose for me to select when you want me to lie to you. Um, and I'll make that decision. And she was like, I would much rather you're honest with me about everything. And I'm like, okay, but you can never take that back. Now. Yeah. yeah. It's now time for the pick and mix, our regular slot where you give us your best childhood stories. Pick and mix, pick and mix. It's time for us to do pick, pick and, and mix. mix. And today you have chosen drum roll, please, Amanda. It's quite hard. There's a lot of saliva on that microphone yeah, it's got now. A sore tongue. Family hell holes. Give me some family hell holes. Uh, so when I, uh, I think it was my third fringe, I was the first fringe that I made a decent bit of money and because my parents had supported my career so very early on, I decided to reward my parents and my brothers with a trip to Disney. Uh, I was 21, my brothers were 11 and 9. And when we were out there, my brother, who was just becoming like very close to a fucking moody teenager, got into a massive argument with my fucking dad. We are... I saw so much of my younger, because I used to argue with my dad when I was younger, and I saw so much of myself in this fucking argument, and I, my dad's in the right, Matthew's just fucking screaming, he just wants to get the last word, and my dad's just not letting him. And at one point, Matthew screams, I'm never talking to you again, and my dad just turns around to me and just goes, like I give a fuck, <laughs> right? And I was just like, oh my God, now I get it. Like, oh, and I, and I had this moment where I took him and my mother aside and I'm like, I just want to apologise for all the years of my teenage when I would fucking yell and scream at you because now that I'm on the outside and seeing what it actually is, I realise how fucking, you know, stupid and annoying I was. And they were like, oh, thanks, man. Yeah, <laughs> they were really lovely. Pretty, they were a little <laughs> shit. It's, it's a nice moment when you start relating to your parents as an adult. Yes. And you start seeing them and they start seeing you as this, oh, yeah, there's a little more equal ground here. Yeah. Praise you like they should. My parents are thick and fast with praise. They are very, very proud uh, parents. Um, but I think they also, they feel that they're a counterbalance to me. And for so many of my career, I was an arrogant, very confident. I'm the greatest thing to happen to fucking comedy guy. That like with my parents and my wife, they're definitely less frivolous with the compliments now because they're like it goes to his head and he's just and then we have to deal with this fucking rats about how great it is but now that i'm in my 30s and i'm becoming more insecure i'm like just a bit more just, yeah, 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 yeah 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 like i love nothing more than when i do a show when i walk off stage and there's like Cara's she's very attracted to me because she, it's, it's, she is so, like, she's just seen her husband go on stage and smash to three and a half thousand people and there's just this look in her eyes of like, that's my fucking husband, that's, yeah. yeah. I'm not saying I want that from my parents, but like the non-sexual version. Yeah, 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 of yeah. course. Hey, there's one last thing, and then you're free. This is called Shall I Be Mother? Shall I Be Mother? You have to look into my beautiful, yeah. bloodshot, sleep-deprived eyes and, and imagine that I am Martin or Leslie, or a horrid Freudian amalgamation of the two. Yeah. And just tell them what? Tell them what you'd like to say. Um, thank you very much for all of your support over the years. I understand that I was several times I was probably not the easiest son to love. Uh, you never took any of it away. It helped me become the father I am today, being inspired by how good you were both at being parents. And I'm sorry I don't phone as much as you would like me to. But I'm very busy. <laughs> Daniel Sloss, thank you for coming to Daddy. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, listeners. If you've enjoyed this episode of Come to Daddy but found the guest tedious, don't worry, you're not alone. I'm in the same boat. And luckily for you, you can come to my solo show. I'm touring around the country with no pesky guests to interrupt my genius. I'm bringing my solo show to Europe and to England because they're separate now, for God's sake. So if you're in the UK, if you're in Cambridge, Manchester, Brighton, Leeds, Bristol, Sheffield or London, 
I'm bringing my show The Butch is Back to Your Town. Or if you're in Europe, in Antwerp, Oslo, Amsterdam, Stockholm, Helsinki, and possibly Berlin, we're working on a date, uh, look up my website, rubenk.com. Tickets are now on sale, and I'm very happy to say, moving fast. And I hope to see you there. If you can't come to Daddy, come to me.